What can you do? Howard and Dory are always telling me I'm too sensitive and let myself get worked up about things. But really, even Howard had to admit that the Lanson's accident just couldn't have happened at a worse time. It sounds awful when you come right out and say it, but I'd always rather be frank and open than mealy-mouthed. And even though it was a dreadful thing to happen any time, it really made me furious to have our trip to Maine ruined. We had lived next door to Don and Helen Lanson for 16 years, since before our Dory and their Vicky were born. And of course, living next door and with the girls growing up together, we had always been friendly enough, even though you don't have to get along with people all the time. And frankly, some of the crowd the Lansons knew were a little too fancy for us. Besides, they were never secret about things and expected us to be the same. And it bothered me sometimes when I stopped to think that for 16 years, we hadn't had a day's privacy. I like friendly neighbors as well as the next one, but it was a little too much sometimes. I used to tell Howard that Helen Lanson always knew what we were having for dinner. And of course it worked the other way round too. Whenever the Lansons had one of their fights, we had to close the windows and go down to the cellar to keep from hearing. And even then, Helen Lanson was sure to be over the next morning to cry on my shoulder. I hope the new neighbors are a little more, well, reticent. Howard and I felt terrible when it happened, naturally. Howard went out with the state police and I offered to go over and tell Vicky. It wasn't the kind of thing I relished, you can imagine, but someone had to do it. And I'd known her since she was born. I was thankful that Dory was away at camp because she would have been heartbroken living next door to them all her life. When I went over to ring the doorbell that night, I really couldn't think how the child was going to take it. I never did think much of parents going out and leaving a 15 year old girl alone in the house. You read all the time about men breaking into houses where girls are alone. But I supposed Helen always figured Vicky was all right with us next door. We certainly don't go out nearly every night like the Lansons did. That bit of judgmental neighborliness came from this collection. This is Shirley Jackson's Dark Tales. Shirley Jackson's Dark Tales. And welcome, my friends, welcome to Stately Vaughn Manor and your Sunday Penguin. And this unsettling book is your Sunday Penguin for the day. Shirley Jackson's Dark Tales. So, Shirley Jackson, famed far and wide for The Haunting of Hill House, wrote some dynamite short stories. Uh, anyone who has read the lottery, and many of you have probably read the lottery, are aware of that, because that story was great. I don't think that story's in here, if I'm remembering right. I don't think it is. Uh, but there are a bunch of other really, really great stories in this collection. Dark Tales. And let me tell you, this book, it lives up to its title. So the thing about Shirley Jackson is... If you've only read The Haunting of Hill House, or maybe that in another of her novels or two, you're really not appreciating her uh, for her full abilities as a writer. To do that, you have to read the short stories. Because her short stories are really something. And they're very different uh, from her novels in a way. Uh, she has to pack a lot in rather quickly in the short stories, of course. And she manages that splendidly. And as short as these stories are, and they're really short, um, they're never, they never seem to be rushed. The pacing is really good in this. And that's important for the kind of unsettling stories that they are. And these stories are unsettling. Shirley Jackson, who seemed to live in a world of comfortable suburbia with dark terrors lurking just underneath, uh, 
that's what a lot of these stories are about. It's kind of this world, a very recognizable, kind of comfortable world that, you know, we can see and we, we recognize and, you know, everything's chill at the beginning of the story, you know, even a little mundane. But then things start to take a turn. And a lot of these stories are kind of like that. They're almost kind of Twilight zone -y, but they're different, you know? They reminded me of that kind of thing, but they're their own thing. They've got their own flavor, their own feel to them, these stories. The way she unsettles you, uh, it's, it's her own special way of doing that. Uh, and these are just great. Um, you know, it's, it's tough with these stories because they are very short and I don't want to spoil any of them. And there are some great stories in here. Uh, this has the summer people in it. The summer people might be the one story from this collection that you've probably read already. If you've read a lot of horror anthologies, for some reason, the Summer People has been just anthologized to death. I mean, I get it. That story is great. And it's a good example of uh, why these stories are great. Whereas in the Summer summer People, which I, I don't want to tell you what it's about, but it starts off kind of, you know, mundane. You're in this mundane kind of situation, this very recognizable world. Uh, and then the characters decide... Uh, they come to a decision, and this decision kind of breaks an unspoken cultural rule. It's an unspoken rule. No one talks about it. And that causes the horrors to happen. Um, and a lot of these stories are kind of like that, where, you know, you just, you're going along, and then you just do one thing, and then, boom, it's over. Or maybe, you know, you're going to pick up your spouse who's been away, you know, on a trip. And then it, you, you kind of recognize right away that they're not your spouse after all. And maybe that's a good thing. And, you know, other creepy situations kind of like that. Where you're in a recognizable kind of suburban-y world. And everything's going fine. And then... Something's not fine. And then you're sliding into just outright horror. And sometimes it's a, it's a kind of a smooth run into just being unsettled and uh, But sometimes, you know, she kind of just takes you along and, oh yeah, it's getting kind of spooky now. Boom! And then she hits you. She could do that really well too. So don't underestimate Shirley Jackson. I know she gets the uh, the rep, I think, sometimes of being kind of uh, a master of quiet horror. And you can see that in here, but don't let that fool you. She'll get you. She can get you. She can hit hard. Shirley Jackson can. And these are just brilliant. It made me wish, as I was reading this, that a lot of the other stories that are in this book were anthologized more often. Um, because I think sometimes even horror fans don't think to pick up anything other than The Haunting of Hill House. Everything she wrote is worth reading. Um, and I think maybe her short stories might get set aside or not picked up as much as some of the, a couple of the other books that she wrote. But really, this is, this is some of the best stuff she ever wrote. And... You don't get the Shirley Jackson experience, really, unless you read some of these. And once you start reading this book, you're just going to go right through it. Because it's great. It's just so dark and unsettling. So yeah, Dark Tales. I'll shut up now. But you want to read this book. Trust me. You want to read it. Dark Tales. Shirley Jackson. Your Sunday Penguin. For today, I will catch you next time. Tomorrow, I'll be talking about a very different writer with Robert E. Howard. Okay, guys, I'll catch you next time.